Uh, my name's Nick Kane. I'll be your host today and we'll go through a nice little case study around Achilles tendinopathy with Peter. Uh, and thanks to all those sort of tuning in live on Facebook, the event was at capacity. So uh, we put that across our Facebook and uh, hopefully people can sort of tap into that and really enjoy what Peter has to say. And before we do kick off, we just want to thank Archie's Footwear for their support on uh, this uh, first of our webinar series and also our recent podcast. So Archie's Footwear to uh, Arch Support Thongs, uh, which are really uh, popular around Australia um, and very sort of comfortable footwear. And they're actually offering our, our listeners from our podcast and this a 20% off uh, in the order. So just head to their website at archiesfootwear.com. Alrighty. So, Peter... Thanks very much for joining us. And, Thank you very uh, much, Nick. Thanks for having me. And it's, uh, you, I'm sure you don't need any real introduction, but uh, for those who maybe don't know Peter as well, he's the physiotherapist at Complete Sports Care and he's the Associate Professor at Monash University, specialising in tendons. Uh, he does run some fantastic courses and workshops on tendon management, along with some great free resources available uh, on his blog that he just mentioned before, uh, with some podcasts as well at tendinopathyrehab.com. All right, so I think uh, we're ready to jump into this, mate. Yep, let's do it. Let's do it. Beautiful. This is our case of an Achilles tendon uh, presentation. So this athlete or person is a long distance running athlete, 36 year old male, four months history of Achilles pain, gradual onset, Worsening pain over the last two or three months. Morning pain, six out of 10. Warms up with running after one to two kilometers. Uh, you can see a typical week there, maybe averages around 65, 70 K. So it sort of gets through plenty of kilometers. Very solid post day of running. Uh, and more recently, he's dropped off one of those running sessions to allow his Achilles tendon to sort of settle back down to a reasonable level to run again. He's very frustrated and stressed that he can no longer run freely. He's tried a bit of physio here and there. Uh, for some modalities mentioned, such as lodar taping, a bit of soft tissue massage, and he had some calf raise exercises uh, to sort of get through. So uh, a pretty typical presentation that many of us might see in our clinics. Um, maybe someone who doesn't run it this much, but this is uh, not too diff not too different to what you'd see pretty commonly. Is it fair to say, Peter? Yeah, I, I would say that's pretty spot on. Yep, that, that sort of hits the mark for a lot of Achilles patients. Perfect. So if this guy came in, he gave you this subjective information. Uh, what would you really nail down around your subjective history uh, to nut this out further? Um, I think uh, some of the important things would be going into a bit more detail about his history. So sort of when it came on, um, you know, was there any change in activity? What were the sort of factors around when it came on? Um, that would be quite important. So changes in activity, changes in load. Um, you're always looking for some sort of change in sort of, you know, stretch, shorten cycle activity. So it'd be you know, running activity or um, some sort of um, impact ballistic activity. Um, so you're looking for that. He might've introduced some hopping, uh, which I know we're gonna talk about a bit later, but he might've just chucked in some hopping because someone said, oh, look, do some hopping, you'll run faster. Um, uh, he might have done something different. So you're always looking for that because that's sort of the key diagnostic uh, clue. Obviously, it's difficult if they've got a, this guy's only got a two or three month history, which he should remember uh, that far back. It's hard if they've got a six, seven year history. If they haven't got any change in activity, you start to think, is this an inflammatory arthropathy or is there something you know uh, different about this? Um, that is something I would consider. So red flags. Um, what else? History-wise, um, very important to look at the site of pain very, very carefully. So you're looking at, is the pain right in the mid-portion of the Achilles? Is, does it say mid-portion? Uh, no, it doesn't say mid-portion. Mid we, are we assuming it's a mid-portion or just doesn't? Yeah, for the case, let's assume it's mid-portion, yep. So, so, if it's, so mid-portion, you'd want the pain to be very localised um, right into the middle of the tendon. Um, if it's a bit more to the, you know, outside, <clears throat> you're starting to think, is it sural nerve? Um, is it, um, you know, perineals? You start to exclude other things. If it's more on the inside, you start to think about tibialis posterior and uh, plantaris. Uh, you also think paratenin. Um, 
that's often more diffuse pain up and down the tendon um, and uh, um, often with paratenin they can get a um, you know a, a medial pain or a lateral pain that's just the specific side of pain as well um, so those those types of things uh, can be helpful with side of pain um, what else would you be looking at? You'd be looking at what aggravates. So you get a really good history of exactly what aggravates him. Uh, so, you know, is it, as you've said there in the case study, sore a day after running. So that's one factor. And he's also got uh, the morning stiffness and pain. Uh, but are there other factors that also aggravate him? Um, so going into things like, you know, um, uh, it could be that walking downstairs in the morning, or it could be that, um, uh, when he starts to run, I, I go into a lot of detail about the running pain. So how much pain does he have at the start of the run? How much pain, um, how does that then change? Does it improve? Does it get better? Or does it get worse during the run? Um, so that's very important because it gives you an idea of severity. So usually the very severe ones just don't get better at all. They don't have that warm up um, pain. Um, what else would you be looking at? So really good history of the loading of the types of things that aggravate him. Um, that sort of gives you load tolerance. So load tolerance is something that I talk about a fair bit, which is um, uh, basically how what activities can they do with minimal pain and uh, pain that um, doesn't flare up for too long after. So, um, so you've said they're sore the day after running four out of 10. So that is sort of okay, as long as it then recovers quickly after that. But if he's sore the next day and then the next day and the next day, then you're starting to think they're not low tolerant to that activity. And it's more likely it's gonna be someone that's gonna need a little bit of time away from running. Um, so that's quite important, uh, low tolerance assessment. And you just get that by asking two questions, one, how much pain do they have with things that really load the Achilles tendon a lot, like hopping, jumping, running, and things like that? Um, and the second thing is how long is it, how long is it worse for after those activities? Um, so that gives you a really good assessment of load tolerance. Um, subjectively, also general health and history and um, all of that stuff, medications, he's pretty healthy. I would take it aside from this. Um, obviously, the psychological aspects, he's frustrated and stressed, um, which is really, really common for a runner if they're not able to run or not running as well. Um, so looking at, um, you know, that side of it and his, how he's coping. Um, so is he just pushing through? Is he, um, is he avoiding pain or is he quite anxious about pain and pathology and uh, then tapping into the psychology of the belief system around pain and pathology? Um, Training loads, so you'd want a good history of how much he's training. So I think it says there he does 15Ks, 12Ks, 20Ks, 10Ks. So is any of that speed running at what speed, um, that sort of thing. Um, which runs is it worse from? Is it worse from speed or is it worse from the long runs? Um, so that sort of stuff. Maybe a bit about treatment. So he's got, he's had, um, I think you mentioned he's done some calf raises. Yep, he's just been given some calf raises from the physio who wanted to build up some endurance of his calves. So that's quite a typical typical sort of thing for them to report as well. Um, I think most patients that I see, if you ask them what, you know, what rehab have you done, most have done calf raises. Most of the Achilles that I see have had you know, two or three bouts of rehab before and most have done calf raises. Um, not, not to say that's not a good exercise. It can be a really good exercise, but... Um, you want to you want to know how they've done it. So have they done it with any load? How long did they do it for? Did they do it properly? Did they adhere to it? All that sort of stuff. Um, and then you probably want to rule out red flags. So I mentioned inflammatory. That's probably the most common one that I see in clinic. People that have got inflammatory arthropathy. Um, that's one that I'm always suspicious of. If they've got say um, bilateral symptoms, very severe symptoms, symptoms that seem to flare for no reason. Um, then I would uh, definitely look at inflammatory screening for them. Um, and what you probably want to do is get them to a rheumatologist uh, to get to have a screen. I sent one soccer player recently. Um, he's got bilateral, um, or I, I just saw him actually, I've just seen him. Um, he's gone back to his home state now 
Um, but I, one of the things that we're suspecting with his club physio is that he's got inflammatory arthropathy. He's got insertional Achilles pain. Um, he's got bilateral pain and he's only 20 years old, but um, he's got really, really severe pain that just reacts to everything. And that could just be a genetic predisposition, but it could also be inflammatory arthropathy. So you do want to check that um, if they've got sign, you know, this sort of disproportionate response to loading where either, either no load at all or minimal load really makes them flare for a long time. Um, that's a good thing to check, inflammatory arthropathy. So yeah, I think, I think they're probably the main things in terms of subjective. Yep. Outside of that, and just as a bit of a sidestep with the question, if this patient was a female, is there anything else you'd ask specific to the female uh, athlete or population that you haven't mentioned there? Probably the only thing is looking for menstrual cycle. So uh, with the young female athletes, um, obviously with your females around menopause age, you're sort of looking at, you know, have they had their menopause? And that would be a factor because they're expecting to be more susceptible. But um, with the young females, obviously, you know, we've all, we've all seen young females who do a lot of running or a lot of um, other activities and they, they have a, um, their, their menstrual cycle isn't regular or stops. And that is potentially, although it's not a known risk factor, it's potentially a risk factor for bone, well, bone definitely, but also for tendon injury, I think, because um, I do see quite a few of those uh, people. But obviously, they're doing a lot of running as well. So that's a big risk factor. So you can't be sure that it is the stopping of menstrual cycle, but that's something that I check. And then you want to get them off to a sports doctor to discuss that and investigate that. Okay. All right, if we, if we've sort of got this information here and we can um, add on some of the subjective criteria around this patient, but if we're now going to dive in and uh, look at an assessment, where, where do you start with your assessment of uh, the patients coming to you? Uh, I would probably look at, um, uh, I always start with a load test assessment. So get them up and get them doing some hopping. Um, you know, so for this guy, it would be, um, probably starting off with a double leg calf raise, single leg calf raise, single leg calf raise over a step, and then um, doing it faster, doing it with knee bend. So progressive load on the Achilles, um, you know, finding out how much pain they have. Now I can tell you the guy I assessed, the soccer player, uh, recently with the insertional, he had a 10 out of 10 pain dropping over a step. Um, this guy here, from his history, I would predict that he would probably have more like a three or four, or, or, or maybe no pain with calf raise uh, because he's not as severe. He's, he's, he's only got four out of 10 pain post running and morning stiffness is quite high. So it depends possibly what day you get him on um, and the hopping and calf raise pain might be there. Much more likely to have pain with a calf raise. So calf raise, he might have a five, six, seven out of 10. Um, if you get him to hop on a single leg, sorry, I meant more pain with a car with a hop than a calf raise. Um, so 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 progress to hopping. Um, you can do forward hops, backwards hops. You can then do a maximal forward hop if you're really searching to reproduce pain. But often with a single leg hop, it's pretty much one of the highest loading activities you can do for the Achilles. So something around five to six times body weight is going through the Achilles when they're doing a single leg hop. So it's likely they're going to get pain with that. Um, so that would be the start. Then I'd move on to diagnosis. So um, things like um, um, looking at um, uh, this, you know, palpation and um, trying to uh, differentially diagnose. So are there any other um, uh, sort of um, sites of pain around the Achilles? Uh, looking at um, some of your tests, you can do things like checking for crepitus, checking for um, you know, checking for crepitus is a good one for paracetamol. Um, you can do, then I would probably, if I was in my clinic, do ultrasound. So I'd do an ultrasound um, uh, examination. And the only reason I use ultrasound is because I see, well, primarily Achilles these days. Um, and um, I, 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 I tend to do it mainly to look at, is there something, is there a differential diagnosis? So there might be, um, you know, peritoneum fluid, or there might be, um, you know, retrocalcaneal fluid, or uh, there might be a peritoneum that is really obviously thickened, uh, something else like that. So it's helpful for diagnosis. 
um, and differential diagnosis, it doesn't really change. Um, so say I saw a really crappy looking mid portion Achilles tendon. So with a lot of thickening, a lot of Doppler and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then I saw the next patient who had just mild thickening. It doesn't, uh, the extent of pathology, and this is where you can talk about the continual model, doesn't really change the management that much. Uh, but it's good for differential diagnosis. Um, the next thing I would do is look at um, an assessment of their um, of their function and strength. So this could include, say, a single leg squat if you're just doing some basic stuff to start with. Um, then I would do calf raise to endurance. Um, then I would do a seated calf raise. Um, and if you have time, I see people for an hour initially, um, which is which is really good for getting in a bit of the kinetic chain, I'd then go on to um, assessing the kinetic chain. So I'd then look for, you know, the you know, uh, glute assessment, um, knee, uh, knee extension in a leg extension machine, leg curl. Um, I would look at sometimes leg press. I would look at um, uh, bridging and hip abduction, 6RM. So I do lots of 6RM testing for kinetic chain. Um, so fit in as much as that as possible. The next time I see them, if I haven't finished that assessment, I would finish the kinetic chain assessment and then also look at running um, if they're not too painful to run. So if they're running pain is say sort of seven, eight out of 10, you might leave that for later on, but uh, otherwise look at running as well. Um, so that that's pretty much the objective stuff I think that I would look at. Now, outside of the ultrasound, you often, um, refer to a little bit of the thickness and, and how, how do you use ultrasound throughout rehab and, and if you do, does it give you any indication um, of where that sort of patient status may be? Yeah, um, I don't think it gives you a lot, unfortunately. Um, I use it for uh, differential diagnosis. I think it's good for that because uh, it uh, will tell you, look, if they've got a peritoneum fluid, maybe you do something else like topical anti-inflammatory or lots of anti-inflammatories orally to help that. Um, uh, if they've got a plantaris, you might consider down the track an injection. So it helps you with planning and, and specific diagnosis, confirmation, but it doesn't really help you to, um, it doesn't, help you in terms of, right, this tendon's, um, you know, going to be treated differently or we can see a response. Um, so the patients do love it though, is what I've noticed. Um, a lot of patients do uh, like it because they feel like you've really, really diagnosed them. And I always educate them against that and say, look, I don't need this to diagnose you. Um, I, I know exactly what's going on. We're just looking at this so we can see if there's anything else going on. Um, and it's more reassurance that ends up happening because you sort of then say to them, look, it's, you've got a thickened tendon. It's not anything that I'm you know, concerned about or worried about. It's not anything different to uh, this Achilles tendinopathy. And you explain what that is. Um, and you explain that, look, this pathology is probably going to stay the same or change very marginally. Um, it's not even worth scanning it again. Um, you know, I, we, we know what's going on. So you sort of move beyond the imaging and you start to focus on function and pain uh, because you know that is um, really the key things that you're looking for. So, so that's, um, yeah, I think it's important to take the focus away from uh, the imaging and the structure, but the patients do like it. And it is, uh, you know, it is of some benefit to be able to reassure them, I think, uh, to say, look, this isn't a really, really, a uh, terrible one with lots of, you know, what people would call tears in, in the tendon. And that's, you know, it, there's a whole minefield of <laughs> imaging uh, in terms of what people are told um, and how bad that affects them and how lack, there's a lack of, complete lack of um, consistency among radiologists and, um, you know, what, what actually is a tear. Um, all those things are real issues that we have to, as people that see these patients, educate them about. Um, so that's, that's, I think, a really important thing. And having the ultrasound there just gives you that extra little bit of, you know, dare I say, credibility for them to say, oh, yeah, he's looked at it. Yep. You know, you don't need it. You absolutely don't need it, but I do find it helpful. Uh, very nice. All right, well, uh, we didn't mention earlier, but we are taking some questions um, from our uh, listed, uh, listeners out there. So I'll just fire a couple at you there. 
why do you use the 6RM testing uh, in your assessment? Really good question. I, I, um, I think uh, there's a number of ways you can measure strength really well in a clinical setting. Um, you can have a King Kong, King Kong um, or a Biodex uh, dynamometer, which is you know, going to cost 60, 70 grand, which is really great if you've got one of those. Um, you can have, you can measure it with a handheld dynamometer or handheld dynamometer that's been stabilized onto something, which a lot of footy clubs do. Um, you can measure it with um, 6RM testing. Um, now, the reason I do 6RM testing is probably more because I find it the easiest and in my hands the most repeatable. Um, and I don't mean to say that uh, handheld dynamometry is not a good way of assessing people. It's, it's a really good way of assessing people if you're really good at it um, and you're able to do it um, and uh, make sure that you're reliable with doing it. So I think, I, think, I think there's a number of ways and I don't think one's better than the other. I just like 6RM testing. I find it is a, is a good way to easily get a reliable number. Um, uh, the issue with it is it takes a long time to do. So it often takes, you're often looking at, you know, five minutes for one muscle group. And that's why I mentioned earlier, often with an Achilles patient, I would do seated calf raise, standing calf raise, and that's it for one session. And then the next time I would look at leg extension and other 6RM tests, because you just don't have time to do it all in the first session. So get them back the next week. And it's a good opportunity to get them back you know, check their exercises, make sure they're on board, uh, make sure they're, you know, they haven't got questions about education stuff. So, uh, yeah, so 6RM dynamometry, it doesn't really make a huge difference. As long as you're measuring it properly, though. Um, what I work with a guy called Luke Perrodin, who's uh, quite funny, and he's got, you know, uh, he's really interested in measuring strength. And um, uh, I think one, one of the things he sort of talks about is you've got to, uh, you've got to, we've got to go away from this, um, you know, uh, what was it, the five-point grading system, the um, Oxford scale um, that we all, you know, taught when we were um, at uni. Yep. Um, so, you know, that's, that just doesn't cut it. You've yep. got to do objective, reliable tests of strength. Um, that's, um, that's really sort of, uh, I think, important. Nice. Now, we'll stay on assessment and a little bit around uh, your running assessment that you mentioned. What do you look at uh, with your running assessment? Uh, and we will have a follow-up question later around probably addressing that in our rehab. But I guess first and foremost, um, yeah, nail down a little bit what we might be looking for more in these type of patients that we see pretty regularly in the clinic. Yeah, so with an Achilles patient, um, uh, you'll often find, depending on how good the runner is, uh, some of the runners... Um, I mean, there's, there's a whole range of things you can find from people who are really full foot, uh, full foot uh, dominant to really heel strike dominant and everything in between, um, really high cadences uh, to low cadences. So um, I think you've got to look at them individually. Um, you uh, often, uh, probably the most common thing is people that run with a high, with a heel strike. And the issue with a heel strike is not so much that, um, obviously with a heel strike, you have less load in the calf than you're at initial contact, which is probably a good thing for the Achilles. But when you get to mid stance, there's most likely more dorsiflexion because you're spending more time on the ground. Um, and therefore more Achilles load. So that's that's one thing to look for. Um, and then the other thing is people obviously transitioning into four foot striking is another common one. Um, pronation, you sometimes see issues with pronation uh, in these people as well. Um, sometimes proximal control. So, so you find the whole gamut of sort of issues. Um, sometimes stiff strategies. So the whole leg is a bit stiff because they're protective of it is also quite common, stiffness, and that can be dorsiflexion or just protective related. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's important to do a good thorough running assessment. Beautiful. Um, I'll go two questions from our listeners uh, around probably targeted with your numbers. So I guess one being, uh, what's your expectations with a single leg calf raise in terms of reps and is there a pass mark? And the second part of that question, I guess, is back onto your six RM testing. What are some strength normals you, you might, use as a benchmark or see in these guys? 
Yeah, look, they're good questions. Um, so basically, uh, with the um, with the first question, if you're looking at, um, there is good data out there, and I'll just try and find it, um, where they basically have looked at people across the lifespan. And they've found that um, people, I mean, we know this, we know this very, very well for our elderly, they, they're gonna be weaker. Um, and that obviously leads to balance issues and all sorts of issues um, and falls and, and um, other things. But um, one of the muscles that really has a very significant reduction in strength is the calf. Um, so you can't really ask the question about what is normal for calf strength until you put into the context of age. So um, age is really, really important. Um, a lot of my Achilles patients who are in their 70s, they can't do five calf raises. Or six calf, sorry about all this noise, uh, five or six calf raises. But some of the other people that you see in their 30s, they can do 40 calf raises. So it really does range. You should be able to do 30 or 40 calf raises until the age of 30 or 40, I reckon. Um, and that's over a step slowly. And that's the other thing. It really does depend on your, how you do the calf raise. And we've done some studies on this recently. My PhD student, Fatma Hassani, she... Um, looked at uh, trying to standardize the way people do the calf raise assessment um, and she talked to, she's got all this she's got this rating scale that she's developed which is going to be published soon um, but people do it with very poor technique unfortunately and that um, uh, and that causes issues but so you've got to yeah it depends on age but if you've got your elderly person who can only do seven calf raises clearly if you want to get them up to say 15 but um, a lot of the Achilles patients, and we'll probably talk about this, touch on this in rehab, uh, if they get to 15 calf raises without load, that's that's enough. They won't get to any more. Really sorry about this. I don't know what is happening with my computer. Um, they won't get to any more than 15 calf raises. Um, uh, and you wouldn't load them. Whereas a young Achilles patient like this guy, uh, you want him to do... Uh, for the rehab, you'd want him to do lots of endurance because he's a long distance runner. You'd want him to do lots of strength. So 6RM, 7RM, 8RM type, uh, you know, six to eight reps. Um, and you want him to do a combination of that. Um, and he would do lots of loading. Whereas your older 70 year old, they might not do much loading. Um, so, uh, and that's because they're so weak to start with. So it really does depend where they start. Um, and the older ones tend to be weaker. Now, I've forgotten the second part of the question. Uh, I think it was around 6RM norms, norms for your 6RM testing for exactly. a, uh, an athlete that we'll use in this case. So someone who runs a lot, basically, who's reasonably fit and runs a lot. Yeah, so someone like, for example, our patient here, um, and this is Igor Sancho, who's another PhD student. He's done a study. He's done a really good study, actually. He's managed to get... 45 people in the case group and 45 in the control group with Achilles mid portion. And he's found that seated calf raise is probably the most effective thing or was the most effective thing. And we found, we found there that I think around 1.3 times body weight is what you should be at for a recreational runner uh, doing a seated calf raise in a Smith machine. And um, um, what the uh, Achilles group was, was around one times body weight. So now that that's uh, about 70, so for example, I weigh 78 kilos. So I should be able to do, um, I should be able to do about 85, 90 kilos on a seated calf raise for 6RM. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's sort of an indication. Obviously that's just an overall average from a group. But um, if you've got someone who is struggling to do their body weight, that's not good. And they're running uh, on a seated calf raise, that's definitely not good. Um, and you've got to get them towards that 1.3 times body weight. Now, some runners, if this guy was an elite runner, he might get to two times body weight. So some people do get much higher than that. So it really depends on how good a runner they are and also what their sort of strength base is like as well. Um, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to move on. There's a very good question uh, from our list and uh, we had a question ready to ask you anyway. I guess around our initial management of this athlete um, that we've presented to you, 
Mm -hmm. We initially, and we, and we spoke about low tolerance before, are we mm -hmm. going to shut him down and get him no longer running, start rehab from the start and build up? Or are we just going to drop a bit of running out and try to modify that? And if so, how do we go about doing that? And how do we find mm -hmm. uh, that nice little balance that we can keep him running and keep him happy? Yeah, uh, that is always a uh, you know really important thing because he's a runner and he wants to run. He doesn't want to just you know he doesn't want to be told look don't run for four weeks or whatever it is. Having said that, if it's important that he stops, then uh, it's our job to basically say to him look you really should stop for four weeks because you're not doing yourself any favors continuing. So that balance is very very important. And it's all based on initially the low tolerance, so how much pain he has. So this guy here has got six out of 10 pain in the morning and he's sore for a day post running. Um, so I would say he's pretty okay. Low tolerance is sort of borderline. I wouldn't worry too much about the stiffness because that is something that often is there even when they're not too bad in terms of they're still able to run and not react too much to the running um, so the six out of ten morning stiffness wouldn't worry me too much but the sore the next day if that's creeping into the second and third day then i would say you've got to reduce significantly or stop for a while and that while would probably be two to four weeks um, but if that four out of ten was improving within a day uh, then i would say uh, look you're running what is it four or five times a week um, let's maybe take off one run um, and let's do every second day and let's see how things go because you're borderline and let's throw in some rehab and if you start to not change at all pain-wise or get worse then we have to take more off so that's sort of how I would uh, how I'd go so build based on low tolerance so yes he's got four out of ten pain the next day but that if that recovers to zero or hardly nothing the day after then I would uh, probably probably maintain some of the running. Having said that, you'd probably assess exactly with the running what he's getting pain with. If he's getting pain with um, fast runs and he's doing some speed, then take that out. Um, so taking out you know the more intense sessions. Uh, if it's just a volume thing, just take out one or two runs. I always err on the side of caution though. And I've learned that from just over the years of treating these patients. The last thing you want to do is get them to keep on running and find out that in three or four weeks time, they're in exactly the same position pain-wise as what they, uh, what they were when they first saw you. So I always err on the side of caution. If you're not sure, give them two weeks and just say to them, look, um, you do have some pain. We really want to get this pain down. Uh, we're going to give you two weeks of running much less. Just maintain one run a week. Uh, only, only do it for, uh, you know, 15 or 20 minutes and let's see what happens. And that's our window of opportunity to get your pain down. And, and uh, in that time, uh, the initial management you would do, if, they, if they're load intolerant, I generally give them the advice to take anti-inflammatories. So I'll say, look, take anti-inflammatories for a week. It will really help. Um, the last thing they want to do is keep running a lot when they're taking anti-inflammatories because it just is a waste of time. Um, so I only do that if you're significantly load managing them because then it makes the load management period shorter, uh, theoretically, and you can start to build them up again. Um, to uh, give them the advice to ice several times a day because uh, it's easy and it generally helps their pain. It gives them a psychological boost. Uh, give them the advice to, you might tape them uh, to, again, ease their pain, heel wedges, um, I give most Achilles patients heel wedges. Um, and we have done it. Uh, Sharon Mons Munson, you out of Latrobe Uni, recently did a trial. Um, and if, if he's used some heel wedges, which are 1.2 centimetres high and incompressible, they're made of hard plastic. Uh, they're the ones that I've started using since that trial. They're really, really good heel wedges. You buy them from Algios. Um, so heel wedges. Um, uh, you might do shockwave initially to manage the pain, um, you know, and just then your rehab, obviously. So rehab could be um, isometric. If it's very, very painful doing isotonic, you would put isometric um, in there. If they can manage isotonic day one, 
what I usually do, someone like this, is give them isotonic three times a week and then isometric on the other days, including the isotonic days. It just maximizes the load and the adaptation of the tendon. Isometrics is really, really uh, useful, but I think much more useful for adaptation rather than uh, for pain in the short term. Uh, not many patients come in, I mean, unless you're working in an elite context or with sports athletes where they are managing pain in season and you want to give them a break, I think then that makes sense, the sort of, you know, Panadol effect of isometrics. But uh, really what most people in rehab want to do is get their pain better long term. And um, I think uh, we know that... Um, uh, if you do isotonic every day, you just don't tolerate it because you're, you're too fatigued. So what, what I give them is isometrics daily, heavy, and then isotonics on every second day for more fatigue and muscle adaptation. So you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting muscle and tendon adaptation maximized. We don't know how much tendon adaptation occurs, but you're at least maximizing your chances of that happening. Um, so that's sort of what I would do in that initial phase. Um, yep. If, uh I'm sorry to jump in, but you, you can carry on with what you want to say. But then let's say we had that two weeks sort of spell, running once a week. We're doing that work. When do we decide that this guy's now ready to run again? What about what, what are our key markers? Because the pain might not be fully gone, but is there a reasonable level? And how do we f find that out? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's... Uh it's important to have so you want to have some sort of load test and that's probably what i should have mentioned earlier um you want to have some sort of load test so say we did our hop at the start and we saw the hop was say you know seven out of ten um, like we sort of predicted earlier then you would um say to the say to the um, athlete look once your hop pain gets to minimal and I usually use the words minimal rather than a number. So minimal or mild. I want you to have minimal or mild hot pain. And that should be achievable within the next two to four weeks if we do this, this, and this. So all the stuff we mentioned. So once you've got, got them to minimal hot pain and then monitoring that every day, uh, then you can start running again or increasing the running. Um, so then you start to build them up and you would then start to do, you know, your volume and, and increase the volume and they start running and then they do uh, beyond the volume. They will then do um, <laughs> the speed sessions come back in again if they were doing speed. Um, we can talk about hopping later. I know you're going to ask me about hopping. No, we can go into hopping now. That was that was coming up and I guess my point was where... Yeah, um, I know we, you can talk to a little bit around the recent sort of trial you guys are doing mm. uh, with hopping, but also, um, and I guess, how will that guide us in our rehab, our prescription, and where does it fit in our rehab sessions if he is still running a couple of times a week and, and we think that uh, stiffness capability or capacity needs to be better? Where does it fit in and does it replace running before or after, mm. et cetera? Yeah, look, it's, uh, it's, I think the hardest part of rehab because uh, tendon rehab really does have two parts. The first part is what we talked about, and that is, you know, shutting down or reducing and managing pain, um, and then trying to do rehab within that phase two. And the second part is then uh, building up again and getting getting back that ability to take load. And that's that's the hardest part. Well, they're, they're both hard at times, but that's that's I think harder because you're trying to get the tolerance of the tendon to uh, take load and. Um, in that phase, um, you would be guided by pain primarily. So pain is the key marker. You want to get the low test pain to minimal and then start them running. Um, the time to start hopping is at the same time as running. There's no problem with doing submaximal hopping right at the start if their pain is minimal. And I often will start running and hopping or progress running and add some hopping in. So usually I work on a three day cycle. So um, uh, day on, day off, day on, day off, day on, day off in terms of either hopping or running. So they might do running on a Monday, running on a Wednesday and hopping on a Friday. And um, uh, you would bring in some submaximal hopping progressively. And Igor Sancho, again, this PhD student, he's done a, He's done this trial where he just looked at if hopping added to Achilles rehab is a safe thing to do. Because one of the 
you know, one of the one of the things we know is that if you do too much hopping, you'll you'll get an Achilles injury. Um, so people are worried, understandably, about getting their patients to do a lot of hopping. Um, but it is really useful for developing power and developing confidence. One of the things that people really do have a problem with is confidence in hopping. If you look at assessing Achilles patients, you can just tell the ones that are apprehensive because they just don't want to hop because they fear it's going to cause problems for them. And uh, they're the ones that you really want to get hopping because you want to develop their power again. Um, and, you, and that's a really good way to give them confidence with doing those activities. So it's a really good way to develop confidence and power. Um, so Igor's, have a look at the paper. He's got um, uh, the hopping program in there and um, it's just a progressive basic hopping program. There's no problem with adding that in right at the start, even if um, they have, um, you know, when their pain is minimal alongside running. Um, the next thing that comes in then is um, speed, so high speed running, and then um, also adding in, uh, as well as high speed running and faster running, depending on if that athlete is doing it. He might be someone that just doesn't do speed as part of his training, that's fine. But if he wants to do speed, then you've got to add that in. And then you've also got to add in maximal hopping. Um, again, that's probably something that is more for high level people, but uh, if they do get to maximal hopping, you've got to make sure that you don't add in the maximal hopping until their strength is pretty good. Um, and what I mean by that is they're getting close to their strength criteria that we spoke about earlier. So the 1.3 times body weight for the seated calf raise. Um, so that's something that I really try and force. You can't really produce maximal power unless you've got maximal strength. Um, you need maximal strength for maximal power. So you can't get someone to jump maximally or hop maximally until they've, or, or even sprints maximally, until they've got maximal strength or close to it. Um, so it's all right to do some speed work, but you've got to bring that in cautiously and gradually, um, and maybe not to 100% or near 100% until their strength is really good. Um, so that's sort of one rule of thumb, which I think is quite useful. Um, so there's two, two sort of levels, I guess, of the return to sport rehab uh, or the end stage rehab. And that is start early based on pain and then progress to maximal based on strength. Yep, perfect. And I might just touch on, I'm going to come back to the hopping uh, briefly, um, but around bringing speed in after volume, does that apply for, would that be the same for say a, a team sport athlete, footballer who's coming back? We still, would we build a bit of volume first and then bring in the speed? Um, or because that game, if we're going to sort of bring it back a little bit quicker, can you transition that a bit faster? And if so, could we find ourselves coming unstuck or it, it doesn't matter too much? Yeah, look, it's a good question. And I think everyone is different. Um, and it depends on obviously their position and what they're used to and their prior sort of training, how long they've been out for, um, how deconditioned they are. But if you've got a deconditioned athlete and you transition them through speed very quickly, that can be a problem. Um, so you do have to be careful with that sort of scenario. But if they haven't been out for very long and, they're, and they've been playing and training and they're used to speed, then it's, yeah, then, then I think you do have to think about what's specific to them and go for, go for that a bit more. So you might take aside some drills that are specific and part of their training and start to gradually start to work them through those rather than going through, you know, the laborious, let's do this, you know, volume, and then let's get into sort of all the speed work after. Yep. And just on the hopping, do you pay much attention to the, the technique of the hopping? Some, some people hop with like a real sort of mm -hmm. slow and, uh, but others can be quite uh, stiffness, show good stiffness to their foot and ankle. Do you pay much attention to that and try to teach them a few things or are you happy just to just get them hopping? Yeah, look, I, um, I look at it. Uh, some people hop, you know, as you say, really stiff and protective. Some people hop, um, really flat-footed, where they're sort of, sort of not using their calf much at all. Um, so looking at um, those patterns and then trying to maybe give them some cues. Uh, probably the best cue is hop on your toes a bit more uh, if they're hopping really flat-footed. 
um, the stiffness cue is very hard, or the stiffness pattern is very hard to cue for because it's really psychological and it's unless they've got confidence to hop, it doesn't really improve. And the confidence comes with just doing hopping. So for some people, just get them to hop and eventually it will get better. As long as you're addressing their pain and as long as you're addressing their strength at the same time. Beautiful. All righty. We are uh, coming on to the end of our webinar time-wise. Uh, so we'll take probably just one or two more questions. Uh, but I guess the part of the title around the webinar was return to sport. And in order to have this guy back to full unrestricted running as an athlete, or if he was a team sport athlete, full, mm. full playing, full, full training, um, mm. what are we mainly guided by here? Are we, are we guided by his, his function, um, his testing, um, mm. and, and how do we really just complete his rehab, so to speak? Yeah, I think uh, return to sport wise, you need to look at um, uh, their maximal strength. So for this Achilles patient, you'd want to see the calf raise, the standing calf, calf raise 6RM. So I'd want him to be at the 1.3, 1.4 times body weight for his uh, seated calf raise, standing calf raise at um, uh, 0.5 body weight or above. Uh, so that's additional to his body weight and standing. Um, then um, it would be minimal pain on any loading test. So no pain or minimal or very stable minimal pain on loading test. So he's not reacting to training. Um, and the other thing is you would have worked through that uh, end stage progression where he would have done you know, the, you know, the running and some of the plyometric work or some of the sports specific work depending on what he's going back to. Um, and you would have worked through the full intensity with that stuff as well. So it's really, really important to work through to full intensity where they feel like in training, you're able to replicate 100% effort, similar to what they were doing before they were injured. Um, that's really, really important. So once they've ticked all those boxes, then they're pretty much ready to return to sport. Excellent. Well, we do have plenty more questions, uh, but we will endeavour to get back to most of those uh, via uh, text or, or typing through uh, because we are out of time. We're trying to keep these two 45 minutes and Peter has his family to get back to. So, uh, you can Peter, in the background, can't you? Uh, we can, yeah. Uh, we thank you very much for joining us for our first uh, Sports Map webinar series. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'm sure a lot of uh, our listeners there have got some key takeaways, mate. So, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Nick. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, mate. And for those tuning in, we do have a, another webinar coming up in one week uh, with Colin Griffith. Talk, Colin Griffin talking about uh, calf strain injuries and rehabilitation and that will have some layover into tendinopathy. So it'll be a nice sort of combination to get a few different inputs. Uh, that is full, but we will go live over the Facebook as well. So uh, we'll get back to your questions. Thanks very much for joining us, Peter. Thanks again and all the best during this time to everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. See you guys. Appreciate it.